Hello, everyone. My name is Christina Howard, and I'm a second year public policy and sociology major calling from San Francisco, and I'm very excited to introduce today's event. While many of us have been able to practice social distancing, people in prisons, jails, and ICE detention centers across the country face a very different reality. A public health and human rights crisis is unfolding in carceral institutions across the nation. At Marion Prison, over 80% of the people incarcerated there have contracted COVID-19. While the numbers at Marion are staggering, it's hard to look at them and not wonder if similar numbers would be found if mass testing were implemented in more prisons. Although new numbers suggest that the virus has been contained at Cook County Jail in April, the New York Times found that it was one of the largest coronavirus hotspots in the US. To date, seven people detained there have died from COVID-19, including William Sobchak. I knew Billy as an enthusiastic participant in the creative writing workshop that I helped facilitate at the jail with a group of other U Chicago students. He was 53 at the time of his death and suffering from advanced cancer. Billy died on May 4th, the day before he was scheduled to have a bond hearing due to his poor health. Mm -hmm. The loss of Billy's life and too many others who have died from this virus while incarcerated was completely avoidable. This crisis has made decarceration a matter of life and death, presenting an opportunity to radically reimagine the future of incarceration in the U.S. Today, we're fortunate to hear from three people who bring a wealth of experience to this issue. Van Jones has been a leader in the fight for criminal justice reform for over 25 years, founding multiple nonprofits, including Dream Corps, which houses the Cut 50 initiative that led the winning campaign to pass the First Step Act. He is also the CEO of Reform Alliance, which brings together cross-sector leaders to give voice to the voiceless to change unjust policies, laws, and practices. Former IOP Pritzker fellow Nika Jones-Tapia served as the warden of Cook County Jail from 2015 to 2018, where she transformed the system's treatment of mental health issues. Her leadership and advocacy are grounded in her own experience of being separated from her father when he was incarcerated, an experience which has led her to work to build emotional wellness for Chicago youth as the inaugural leader in residence for Chicago Beyond. Finally, our moderator today is Cheryl Corley. Ms. Corley is a Chicago-based NPR correspondent who focuses on criminal justice issues and is particularly interested in issues and reform efforts that affect women, girls, and juveniles. Please join me in welcoming Van Jones, Dr. Nika Jones-Tapia, and Cheryl Corley. Thank you, Christina, and my condolences to you and all the folks in your workshop about the uh, death of William, or Billy as you called him. I think his death makes this conversation uh, even more relevant, so I'm glad that we're having it this evening. Um, I want to begin with uh, a number that's often cited when we talk about uh, the criminal justice system. We talk about how many people are incarcerated in the United States, more than two million folks, highest number uh, of, uh, in the world for a country. And it's also meant that the uh, country's jails and prisons have been particularly vulnerable to this scourge of COVID-19. Uh, there's been such increasingly grim news as we talk about the thousands of inmates, detainees, and correctional staff that have tested positive for coronavirus. You know, what happens in jails and prisons to the residents there and to the staff is often relevant only to those who are deeply involved in the criminal justice system. And I think COVID-19 is changing that. Uh, an example that makes that plain is the effort throughout the country to release um, nonviolent um, uh, offenders while the fear and the resolve about COVID-19 uh, spreads. Uh, today, as our, uh, our guests will tell us, the criminal justice system is vastly different from what it was even six months ago. Uh, so we're going to talk about that during the next hour. Uh, for the first half, it's a three-way conversation between myself and our two distinguished guests, Van Jones and Nika Jones-Tapia. Uh, and then the second hour, second half of the hour, uh, you'll be able to uh, question our guests. And uh, one way to do that is by putting your questions in in the question portal of Zoom. So. Um, Let's get started. And Nika, I'm, I'm going to start with you because I think a lot of us, you know, we know about prisons and jails from watching television <laughs> and have never really been in one. 
Uh, you have definitely been in one. You've been the warden of the Cook County Jail. So why don't you, you know, lay it out for us. Uh, what is it like, the physical layout? Why is it such a, a petri dish, as people have said, for the coronavirus? Yeah, sure. I'll start by providing a little context. You mentioned it in the beginning, but you know, this country incarcerates more people than any other country in the world. And because of that, most of our jails and prisons are overcrowded. And so many of the precautions that we've been told to take here in the general public are very difficult to take in a correctional system. For example, social distancing, mm -hmm. you know, being six feet apart from people. So most jails and prisons are either celled living units or um, dormitory style settings. Mm -hmm. So in a celled unit, two people live in a six by eight space. Um, in a dormitory setting, you have anywhere from 25 to 60 plus beds in a wide open space, but they're typically a few feet apart. Most of the bathrooms, um, sinks, toilets, showers are all communal. And so when we think about um, the, the, the precautions that we have difficulty making here in the general public, it's even more difficult in a correctional facility. Um, cleanliness is difficult to maintain in your household. And so when you think about a living unit with 50 plus people, it makes it even more difficult to maintain cleanliness. We know that sanitation supplies, PPE, is difficult to attain here, again, in the general public. And so we know that it's even that much more difficult to attain in the correctional setting. And then frequent washing of the hands, soap and hand sanitizer. Typically, people who are incarcerated have to purchase their own soap. Hand sanitizer has been identified as contraband, but now more facilities are having to purchase hand sanitizer and, and soap and loosen some of those restrictions. But if they don't, then it makes it all the more cumbersome and difficult, nearly impossible for people to, to take those necessary precautions. You know, I think that that would surprise a lot of people that um, folks in jails and prisons have to buy their own soap. That that's not something that is provided by the institution. Isn't that weird? Not at all. You know, when we think about the men and women who are incarcerated in our facilities, many of them have to, to pay for basic medical treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and w when we know that that's the one population in this country that is required to receive adequate medical care. And so there are many things that happen within a correctional facility that shouldn't happen, but because the public is cut off from seeing and making true observations of what occurs, a lot occurs it shouldn't. Van, uh, Nika, just, uh, Nika just talked about some interesting things about the public not really knowing uh, what goes on, that we think of jails and prisons as kind of like isolated islands. But talk to us a little bit about how that should change and how we should really view prisons and jails as uh, when we talk about the larger community, especially in connection with COVID-19. Well, I'm just uh, it's an honor to be here and be a part of this conversation. It's a very important conversation, especially for this new generation that's coming up um, that's beginning to really re rebel against the notion that uh, we should have the biggest prison population in the history of the world, the biggest peacetime prison population in the history of the world times two. Uh, mm -hmm. The United States uh, only is, we're, you know, we only have about 5% of the world's population. We have 25% of the world's prisoners, a quarter of all the human beings locked up anywhere in the world are locked up in US jails and prisons right now as we're speaking. And that 2.2 million people, uh, you know, China's got a million people locked up. You got a billion people in China have a million people locked up. Um, so you're dealing with a, a catastrophe. And now the virus moves through that population five to 15 times faster than it moves through a normal population because of what was just said. You have people crammed in, uh, on top of each other, you know, these dorm settings or, you know, too many people in a very small cell. Um, uh, and you have 7,000 jails and prisons. Each one of them could become the next New York. And as you look at the top 100 vectors for the virus, 59 of them are jails and prisons. So you cannot defeat this plague 
you cannot defeat this pandemic. You cannot defeat this virus on the outside of the prison if you do not defeat it on the inside of the prison. And what you've seen in Asia is those countries who thought they had the thing beaten, thought they had this thing licked, when they didn't pay attention to the migrant camps where you have people with, just as was said, little access to water, crammed in close together, the virus came back from those places. This virus is trying to teach us something about oneness and wellness. That's the message from this virus. Whenever a plague comes, uh, those of you who are, are, are people of faith who follow any of the great religions, whenever a plague comes, it's trying to teach something. Uh, usually prophets have come with a message and they've been ignored. Uh, we've had many prophets, you know, some of them, you know, uh, are better known than others, you know, but we've had prophets, you know, Oprah Winfrey, uh, uh, Big Bird, Mr. Rogers, all these prophets, Ellen DeGeneres, telling us about unity, telling us to be good to each other, and we've ignored them. And now this virus comes, and what it's teaching us is simply this. We're all one. Uh, this virus doesn't care what color you are, if you're in jail, or if you are the guard, or the food services person, or anything else, or if you Democrat or Republican voted for, for Trump, if you're how you pray, this virus just jumps from body to body to body to body to body. And we need a movement that can go from heart to heart to heart to heart with the same velocity and take care of everybody. Mm -hmm. You can't say, well, I don't care about those people that are in prison. Nobody was sentenced to die of a virus in a US jail or prison no matter what they did. And let us not forget that there are people who are sitting there just because they can't make bail. They haven't been convicted of anything. Yeah. There are people sitting there just because of a minor non-crime technical violation of probation and parole. They haven't committed a new crime in 15 years, but the parole system and probation system is so complicated. They missed a payment or missed a meeting or they, they uh, went to the wrong neighborhood to check on their aunt. They weren't committing any new crimes, but not supposed to be in that neighborhood. So we have said it's okay to deprive someone of their liberty because they violated probation. Well, now you might deprive them of their life because you're gonna stick them in a plague infested, pandemic infested jail. And you think it's okay because it's just them, but the virus knows we're all one. And so you have to take this seriously if you want to defeat this plague in the United States. I know a lot of the um, uh, administrators in jails and prisons are learning their lessons right now because of this. And, and we've seen a lot of changes uh, that have taken place because of it, uh, either spurred by lawsuits or not. Um, but we've seen, you know, people being released from jail. We've seen the efforts inside the jail to uh, bring some of the things that you were talking about, Nika, the, the sanitation, the PPE, the uh, uh, trying to put people in single sales, that sort of thing. So to both of you, knowing what the situation is and knowing the efforts that are being taken, are, are you encouraged at all by what's happening inside the jails right now and the prison? Let me first say that just to piggyback off of what Van said, prevention has to be the priority. Mm -hmm. And prevention means releasing more people. And so I'm hopeful that you know we've seen some forward movement with the releases of people, but we know that there are tens of thousands more that need to be released. And and Van commented on the 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 overwhelming majority of people housed in jails being there because they are poor and not being able to afford their bail. There's about seven hundred thousand people locked up in our nation's jails right now. Two thirds of them are there pre-trial. That means they have not been convicted of a crime. And so when we talk about changing hearts and minds, we know that this is going to be a long process, but this disease won't allow us to wait and it won't allow us to be slow moving. So we have to be much more um, speedy with the reforms that we're making and they have to be much more um, um, on a level of a pandemic. And so, <laughs> Hopeful, but a lot of work still needs to be done. 
You're talking about, um, you are talking about the people who are in jail, many of them uh, pretrial detainees, but then we're also talking about prisons, and yeah. these are folks who have been convicted of crimes. And, and Van and, and Nika, even though, you know, you say that there needs to be less incarceration, more people be, need to be out, you get this pushback, yeah, from folks who go, look, uh, these are, vi are you talking about violent criminals and how do we keep people safe and, and victims who say, you know, I need to know about these folks that are being released and folks who have abused me. So how do you, are those, aren't those credible um, arguments and, and what do you say to those folks? Well, the first thing I say is that um, uh, all of us want peaceful streets and safe communities. Uh, nobody on, is a part of the pro-crime lobby. Um, I'm raising two black boys in Los Angeles. We, I was raising them in Oakland. Nobody wants to see crime go down more than me. Um, that said, we have people in our jails and prisons, and let's, let's talk about the prisons, the ones that have been convicted of something. Yeah. Who are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, these people are not a public health, I mean, a public safety risk, statistically, no matter what they were convicted of um, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. You have people in there who before the virus hit were very, very sick. Um, and you have people in there for very minor offenses. If you just draw a circle around the people who are old, sick, and then for minor offenses, you can still take out tens of thousands more people from our existing system, put them in home confinement uh, and let them wait this thing out there and, uh, and, and have a more manageable population. Mm -hmm. The problem that we have is uh, the math starts to break down when people, for some reason, look in the face of people who have been uh, called, quote unquote, a criminal. You'll let 10,000 people die, 100,000 people die who didn't have to die because you're afraid that maybe one of them might get out and steal a car or do something bad. Well, we don't want any of them to get out and do something bad, but you can statistically radically reduce the risk of that. But statistically, you are exposing people to death uh, and in numbers that are shocking. And so what I would say, listen, this, these are not easy uh, questions, uh, but uh, uh, public safety questions are never easy. Yeah. But nobody has been sentenced to die of a virus in, the, in this country. And uh, there are reasonable, prudent, smart steps that can be taken much greater than what we've done. We've seen about 42,000 people come home from jails and prisons. That's great. But there's 2.2 million people locked up still. So we're missing at least one zero. Like we're an order of magnitude short. And we still uh, have time to act before we have a catastrophe inside these prisons. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you. You both have uh, programs that you want to have in place that would do exactly what you're talking about, Van. Uh, you're the head of the uh, Reform Alliance, and uh, the group has come up with a safer plan. Uh, what is that plan, and and how are you hoping it will help alleviate this situation? Well, I'll speak to it briefly because I know that there's many other things we want to get to. But the safer plan is basically uh, it, a a longer uh, approach to what I just said, mm -hmm. getting the people out who are sick, old, and of low risk so that you have more manageable population of people who are inside uh, who can then socially distance, who can then be isolated in a humane way, and we can get through this thing. Um, uh, the Reform Alliance, which is you know started by Jay-Z and Meek Mill and Robert Smith and a bunch of other people, uh, Robert Ru uh, Michael Rubin, um, you know, our commitment is to deal with this probation and parole set of problems. But we realize, again, taking people's liberty is taking their lives now. Um, so we said, get people out, number one. Number two, don't put people back in jail and prison for dumb stuff. If you can give somebody a ticket or a citation or something like that, don't arrest people and stick them into a, a jail or a prison that could be full of the virus. And then after 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, send them back home. You're bringing the virus in and out. Don't do that. And then lastly, bring in masks and other PPE. 
And you may have seen the announcement today that we've partnered with the, you know, my, myself and Jay-Z and the Reform Alliance have partnered with the, with the sheriffs yes. to get all those masks into every jail and prison in the United States. So that's what we're about. Get people out safely when you can. Don't put people in for dumb reasons and get PPP in. Save lives. Now, Nika, uh, Nika, when we uh, often talk about the criminal justice system, um, we often think about men in prison. And I want to know, um, you know, how is this uh, virus affecting uh, women? Are they facing the same sorts of issues that, that men in prison and jails are? And then secondly, you're a psychologist, so I want to ask you about um, juveniles and juvenile facilities because a lot of these kids are uh, placed in isolation uh, several hours a day and we know what the studies have said about people being uh, confined for that length of time and kind of the psychological ills that come with that. So how do you balance, you know, the physical safety of juveniles and the psychological impact that might come with this? So a lot of questions there, but women and juveniles. Yes. So um, you oftentimes hear more about men because our correctional systems are filled with more men than women. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of reasons for that, but one of them is because the criminal justice system tends to be um, a little more... Um, forgiving of women who are convicted of, or charged with crimes because they see them as being um, a parent and naturally needing to be at home to take care of their children. You know, we at Chicago Beyond have been trying to push this narrative of the importance of fathers as well for that um, very reason. So many of our children, more than 5 million children, at some point in their lives will have an incarcerated parent. And most times it is a father. And so I don't want to, to take fathers out of the equation. But to your question on the impact to women, yes, they are removed from their children. It is painstaking. But again, I would say the same is true for the men who are incarcerated. For juveniles, the um, this pandemic is even worse for them. When we talk about um, what correctional facilities have been doing, many of them have re reverted to solitary confinement or isolation, putting people in a cell by themselves with minimal contact with other humans. And we know that that can be psychologically distressing to anyone, but particularly for our young people. And the National Commission on Correctional Healthcare, it's a um, organization that uh, writes guidelines to help ensure quality treatment in correctional facilities. They have taken the stance that solitary confinement should not take place for any healthy adult for more than 15 days and for any juvenile and person with a serious mental illness, period. And so we have to think differently about how we are dealing with this disease and this pandemic within our juvenile facilities and ensure that juveniles are getting out of their cells for longer periods of time, ensure that programming is still ongoing and as quickly as possible for mothers, fathers, and for juveniles, reinstate visitation as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just add to that as well, uh, that's very well, well put obviously. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, because visitation is being curtailed because people don't want to have the virus coming in and out, it's an opportunity for us to revisit a lot of stupid policies with regard to charging people a gazillion dollars for a 10 minute phone call, mm -hmm. um, not allowing video visitation um, in too many of our jails and prisons. Um, you know, we should, you know, people, it, it, it's, it was unbelievable how much money uh, you spend if you have a loved one in jail. Uh, you know, the people, as the doctor was saying, having to spend tremendous amounts of money on, on, on women's hygiene project, pro, uh, products, um, soap, uh, just basic necessities that you would assume would be provided. You have to spend, you have to take money out of commissary or, or work for, say, well, that's good. They should be, you know, working. You know, they're terrible people. These are all horrific, awful people. Um, you got a lot of nonviolent drug offenders watching this right now. Um, uh, they're called students, um, but very few of them are going to go to prison. Um, most of them are going to graduate and they'll realize that that's a waste of their time and they're going to move on with their lives. But young people in our communities 
doing the same stuff I saw kids doing at Yale when I was at Yale, doing the same stuff I see people doing in country clubs and yacht clubs now that I'm a TV person. The same drugs, the same illegal activity that we either laugh at or people go to rehab for in these affluent communities, people go to prison for uh, in our communities. And then when they're there, they get bled dry financially. It costs so much to call home. It costs so much for, for little tiny things. So there's an opportunity here uh, to knock out all these crazy fees around phone calls, to establish uh, you know, video vis visitation in our jails and prisons and keep families together and keep people mentally healthy enough so that when they do come home, they can do a good job. How optimistic are you all that uh, you know, the video visitation, some of that is happening in places, uh, even court proceedings, especially now, uh, are happening with video uh, uh, presentations. Um, and we seem to have uh, persuaded uh, both prosecutors and defense attorneys to come together and, and talk about, you know, releasing prisoners, something that you don't think wouldn't have happened like, you know, four or five months ago. So how uh, optimistic are you uh, both being in this field, both trying to make changes, that some of these things are actually going to become permanent. You know, I think more conversations like this are helpful because it will continue to enlighten the public on the realities of the criminal justice system. I think so many people falsely believe that the criminal justice system works and this virus is showing people that it does not. It doesn't work if you are poor and it doesn't work if you are black and brown. And so we have this, you know, um, this, this policy in this country or this mantra that, you know, there is a presumption of innocence. It's time for us to really act that way. Um, and when we think about just to put a pin in some of the things that we've said, two thirds of the jail population not being convicted of a crime we need to make sure those people can battle this pandemic in their homes as long as they do not pose an imminent risk to safety. For people who are in prison, we need to look past the nons, the nonviolent, the non-serious, and include people who have been charged and convicted with violent offenses because we know that people age out of crime. And so the more that we continue to push these conversations and indict not people, not the people who are the elected officials, but the criminal justice system itself, we can turn this thing around. How does restorative justice uh, play a role in, in the situation we have today? I mean, the practice was here uh, long before uh, COVID-19 came around. Uh, but do you, Van, do you expect the use of it to, to grow? Well, it, it will if we fight for it. Um, I was very proud at CNN to do a series called The Redemption Project, eight um, uh, episodes, episodes showing restorative justice. People say, what is that? Well, there are two forms of justice. One is retributive, meaning retribution, meaning revenge, meaning you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. And the way in that system, the way you get to justice is you add damage to damage. Damage plus damage equals justice. That's the retributive justice model. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. Um, that's not the only form of justice. There's another form of justice called restorative justice, which says when you trespass, when you violate norms and rules and other people's, you know, uh, uh, persons and property, you un unbalance the whole community. That's not just something that you did, you know, to the state or to that person. You screwed up the whole thing. Now the whole neighborhood screwed up. So in order for us to get back to justice, there has to be healing and a restoration of balance. Uh, the person who was hurt needs to be healed. Uh, the community needs to have an opportunity to say how they felt about this whole situation and they need to have a voice. And you need to take steps to uh, uh, learn, learn and to, to pay back and to come back better. Now, that idea of, of you know, adding healing to harm uh, is restorative justice. And it turns out often a lot of people who are themselves victims of crime, if you ask them, do you want the person who stole your bike to go to prison for five years? Or do you want the person even who hits you upside the head in the neighborhood 
to go to prison for 20 years. We'll say, no, I don't want that. What I actually want for them to do is explain to me, what the hell are you doing stealing my bike? Why'd you hit me upside my head? I want to be able to tell them how it felt. I want to be able to know that they're sorry. I want to see them do better. Well, there's nothing in our system that allows for that ordinarily. Um, in fact, the crime isn't even against you, it's against the state. So it's the state versus Billy. It's the state versus, you know, Takesha. Um, and the victim not even given a voice at the time. They might get a victim impact statement at the end. So uh, we've been pushing very hard for this restorative justice model, especially with juveniles, especially for more minor offenses, to give the community a chance to heal, to give victims a voice, and to give people a chance to get back into the community with some kind of lesson learned and not just being branded and hurt and harmed by our prison system. And I hope that more people will do it, but it won't happen automatically. Mm -hmm. Nika, um, Chicago Beyond, uh, as I understand it, is, is looking at this as well and want to give you a chance to talk about the pilot program that, that you're involved in, which, if I'm not mistaken, does center around restorative justice. Uh, in a way, it does. You know, we, we focus on maintaining the family engagement and maintaining family connections, as we've spoken about earlier. And we know that with the number of children who have an incarcerated parent, that research tells us the best way to support not just the child who has the incarcerated parent and not just the incarcerated parent, but the society as a whole is to maintain that relationship between the child and the incarcerated parent. And so we have partnered with the Cook County Sheriff's Office here in Chicago, the Chicago Children's Museum and Lori's Children's Hospital Center for Childhood Resilience to employ trauma-informed, child-friendly, family-centered visitation at the jail. Most jails across the country only allow people to visit with their loved ones through a pane glass window for a few minutes. And we know that that is not trauma-informed. And in fact, that does more heart harm than, than healing. And when we look at the restorative justice model, as Van just talked about, you know, we want to instill more healing into this process. And that's for everyone around. And then what we learn is that the, the correctional institution itself will be improved because people will be treated like humans. It's about replacing this, this harm model with human dignity in our criminal justice system. We have a lot of questions from uh, students and I'm going to uh, start off with one that comes um, from Brianna Payton, a current student in the School of Social Service Administration. And she asks, how should people who want to enter the criminal justice reform and advocacy space be thinking about approaching this work in the era of COVID? Should our strategies or focus change? She's specifically asking as a graduating master's student. What do you think? I would say that there are many um, advocacy groups that you can become a part of. Van just talked about um, the work that they're doing at Reform Alliance. You can reach out to Chicago Beyond. We can um, assist you with um, getting involved with some of the justice work that we're doing, but reach out to different advocacy groups and, and, and learn what's happening in the space first. And then once you learn what's happening in the space, determine the best way for you to intervene. I, I think that your presence will speak volumes. The next question, Van, you wanna add anything or should I move on to the next question? I think she, she handled it. <laughs> All right, Amy Foe asks the next question and she says, I am currently a student at the Booth School of Business. I am wondering what your thoughts are on how businesses in the private sector can have a hand in influencing prison reform and how can these businesses contribute to reducing the rate of recidivism in society? Well, we'll hire folks who are coming home. Absolutely. I mean, you know, that's the, the biggest problem you have is we have a system now that's so unfair. Um, you know, we give people sentences that are too long in the first place. You know, in other countries, you know, you, you mess up, everybody messes up. You get caught, you might do two years, three years, six months. We give people 10 years, 15 years, 30 years. I mean, it's ridiculous. Then when they come home, they're leaving a physical prison and now they go into a social prison mm -hmm. where as long as they have that F on their forehead, felon, 
then nobody wants to hire them. Uh, nobody wants to rent an apartment to them. Nobody wants to give them a student loan or a scholarship. You have whole federal loan programs that if you have that conviction on your record, you're not even allowed to apply for a scholarship. Well, now how the heck are you supposed to come home and do a good job when you can't work, live, or learn? And so if you run a business, you should, uh, in my view, uh, be aggressive about trying to create opportunities for, opportunities for people coming home from prison. We have the biggest prison population in the history of the world times two, as I said. And it is a human rights catastrophe. And people are going to prison for stuff that employers did themselves this past weekend. Uh, you got employers who themselves use drugs or have or have broken the law at some point when they were teenagers, they didn't get caught. Now they're sitting up on their high horse saying, well, I can't hire you. Look at you, you're, you're a criminal. Well, how many people listening to this have broken the law? You know, it's, it's who gets caught, who gets labeled, who gets blamed, who gets left out. And so people who run businesses have the opportunity to break with that. Don't make people uh, jump through 97 different hoops if they have uh, something on their record. Uh, the reality is most employers will tell you if you hire someone from this population of folks who are coming home from prison, who want to work, which is the majority of them, not all of them, but the majority of them, who want to work, they'll be your most loyal and hardworking employees because they know their chances are limited and they want to do a good job. And if I can just add to that, during the period of time that people are incarcerated, that is time where they can learn some of these employable skills. And so businesses not only should hire people who are leaving the correctional institutions, but should go inside of the correctional institutions and teach some of those skills. Develop job training programs or what you're looking for and teach those skills so that people are prepared in the way you want them to be prepared when they leave the facility. I was at a uh, prison in uh, Washington, I believe it was Washington, no, North Dakota. <laughs> and uh, they run a program there where they uh, bring in uh, union folks in the construction trades and they uh, run programs there. Um, it was a women's prison. Um, and then when folks get out, uh, they have kind of a leg up and can go straight into these uh, construction industries and, and work. Um, at another prison um, that is doing somewhat similar work, um, they got some of their ideas from traveling out of the country elsewhere. So I, I want you all to just talk about that. What kind of models are out there that you think are, are good in other countries that the United States should be paying attention to? Norway. Norway is one that we should keep our eye on. They have one of the lowest rates of incarceration and lowest recidivism rates in the world. They, their criminal justice system model is based off of the restorative justice practices that Van just talked about. And instead of imposing prison sentences, they instead impose community sanctions where people actually have an opportunity to um, work on repairing the harm that they cause to the community. And so we know that something is working well there based off of their numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Germany also. Um, look, you, you, very few countries have as dumb and mean and expensive and, and counterproductive a system as we do. We spend $80 billion a year, every year, locking people up. And most of them come out much worse psychologically, spiritually, physically, then they went in. Um, and this is so-called the land of the free. If you are a conservative, you should be appalled by what you're hearing. Uh, because first of all, we are describing a massive failed government bureaucracy that is gobbling up liberties, gobbling up money with no accountability and bad outcomes. That is the opposite of what conservatives say that they want from government. They say they want limited government, you know, individual rights, liberties, that type of stuff. You're not getting that from this thing. This is a big failed government bureaucracy gobbling up liberties, gobbling up money. Um, and uh, if you're a religious conservative, you should be doubly appalled because where is the redemption? Where are the second chances? Where does a fallen sinner 
get a chance to rise again. Uh, you know, so uh, people is a liberal issue. This is not a liberal issue. Um, the, the left is outraged by the injustice of it, the racial injustice, the gender injustice, the injustice toward the poor uh, is now, as Brian Stevenson says, is better in our system. And it's a shame to say this, but it's true. It's better to be rich and guilty than poor and innocent in our system. You'll have a better outcome if you are guilty of sin but rich than if you are innocent and poor. And so, yes, the left is outraged by the injustice, uh, but the right is increasingly now outraged by the attacks on liberty. Uh, the, just the, the, the out of control nature of this police and prison state. And so when we come together on this, and we bring the left that cares about justice together with the right that cares about liberty, that's a liberty and justice for all movement. We talked about dealing with this uh, incarceration industry. That is a liberty and justice for all movement. Uh, and this next generation coming up needs to take it all the way uh, home. Uh, we should have half as many people in prison, maybe 75% of the people in prison right now uh, and a fair system uh, would be home with no increase uh, in, in uh, crime and no decrease in public safety. Why do I say that? Because every other country in the world has rates like that. We're the only ones with rates like this and we got a worse crime rate. It's interesting that you, uh, you bring up the issue of politics and the left and the right because we have a question from Alexander Rosen. He's a, a, a current student at Harris. And he says, we have seen the pandemic shine a light on our country's deepest inequities. At the same time, when you highlight these systematic problems, you are pegged as politicizing a pandemic. So how do we seize this moment to spark prison reform without it devolving into a, a partisan brawl? I mean, you, you talked about it a little bit, Van, but you know, in, in some sense, it might be uh, preaching to the choir for folks who believe that. And then you have the, the folks who are staunch opponents. So how, how do you persuade? Well, we, you know, I, I know a little bit about this in that um, 18 months ago, I was standing in the Oval Office with Donald Trump uh, signing a criminal justice bill uh, that we passed on a bipartisan basis through the US Congress. Uh, 87 senators out of 100 uh, Democrat and Republican voting to reform the system in the First Step Act. 13, well, 12 voting against. Lindsey Graham was stuck on a plane and didn't get a chance to vote at all. He would have voted with us. We had 88. Uh, this is an issue that, you know, the right set of reforms, the correct set of reforms, can bring people together. And of course, you always have people uh, on the left who, you know, want policies to maybe go too far. You have people on the right who don't want anything to change. But there's a big chunk of people in the middle uh, in both parties that are reasonable people and want something to get done. And I don't think that any of us should shrink back from, a, oh, you're politicizing something. Ain't nothing more political than this virus. Uh, this virus seems to hate uh, poor people. Uh, it seems to hate people of color. Uh, it seems to hate uh, uh, working folks. Uh, and all the people who are on the front lines in these grocery stores and in and, and, and these hospitals um, uh, who were not able to get PPE, who maybe can't see a doctor themselves. Those are all political issues. Um, but the opportunity that we have is to bring both parties together and say, now it doesn't sound so crazy to say you want health care for everybody. If somebody wants to see a doctor, they probably should be able to. That doesn't sound so crazy. Now it doesn't sound so crazy when you say, hey, I'm working you know, on the front lines here can I get $15 an hour? You couldn't pay anybody watching this $15 an hour to go stand in these grocery stores and, and, and this face this virus. You couldn't pay them $150 an hour. So some of the stuff that we've been talking about before that seems so left wing and out there may now start seeming more like common sense. But don't worry about somebody calling it political. And don't worry if it's, if it's left or right. Worry about if it's right or wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, it is wrong for us to let this many people uh, lose their liberty and now their lives in an unjust system. And, next, both party, and, and both parties now will tell you that. The next question uh, comes to us from Alexander Petzakis, and she's gonna appear on video here. 
Hello, my name is Alexandra and I'm a second year in the college majoring in sociology and global studies and I'm currently in Southern California. I'm very interested in criminal justice reform and I've always been very fascinated by detention centers. So this event has been so wonderful. Thank you all for being here. Um, I was wondering how this discussion about incarceration and COVID-19 in the American criminal justice, criminal justice system um, can be relevant to understanding how the pandemic has affected like ICE detention centers and refugee camps. Yeah, I, I really can't speak much to refugee camps, but I can tell you that um, many of the ICE detention centers are worse off than the jails and prisons that we've been describing. You know, when we um, talk about the separation of people from their loved ones and um, thinking about some of the the unsafe and, and, and poor conditions of jails and prisons, we know that some of our immigration detention centers are in worse sanitation and in worse condition. And so um, I wish I could answer that question a little more wholeheartedly for you, but we know that more needs to be done there as well. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, the next question is from Kate Emden, a current grad student, and Kate asks, what are the most effective strategies for raising public awareness and influencing public opinion around issues of incarceration? <laughs> well, you know, the, the opposite of humanization is criminalization. Once you label someone as a criminal, you essentially dehumanize them. Conversely, the opposite of criminalization is humanization. When you tell someone's story, their true story of how they wound up in a situation and why they made the decisions that they did. And it, we, we, we tend to have a different view. And I tell people all the time, I've never met anybody who said about their own child, my child is using drugs, my child is smoking marijuana, my child is, is, is you know, gotten hooked on heroin. I think my child should have 25 years in prison. Nobody says about their own child. About their own child, they say, no matter what law they broke, they say, listen, my, my child needs help. Maybe we need to hold them accountable, but also we need to hold them. We need to help them. You don't just beat them accountable, incarcerate them accountable, kick them accountable, shoot them accountable. You got to hold people accountable. You got to hold them. That's what people want for their own children. And then they'll sit on jurors, juries and give people 25 years for stuff that they wouldn't give their own child. Why? Because of the dehumanization. The reason that in Norway and Germany, the system works better is possibly that it's more homogenous. And so when that judge and that prosecutor and that juror are looking at that person being charged, they're seeing themselves because they might be the same color, skin color, might be the same faith. Our challenge in America is to have the children of every nation here, to have every color and kind and faith of human being in the world in one country and we mostly get along but it's tough and to treat everybody's child like it's your own child to, to treat everybody's child as if it's your own child that's tough but when you don't do it you wind up with these completely outrageous uh outcomes where african americans use illegal drugs uh at uh the same exact rate as whites most people don't know that. The, the Department of Justice year after year says that we use illegal drugs at the exact same rate, and yet African-Americans are 50% more likely to go to prison. Oh, did I say 50? Six times more likely to go to prison for the exact same behavior. And so, you know, uh, how do you deal with that? Is you tell those stories and you try to humanize the communities that have been criminalized. Uh, and hopefully we wind up in a different place as a country. And as Brian Stevens says, get proximate, you know, get close to the situation at hand. And that starts with the language that we use, not referring to people as inmates and detainees because that dehumanizes them. Refer to them as their name, refer to them as who they are. They are mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, and that will help us to better understand how they are in relation to us. We are not um, going to beat this problem if we continue to see 
people who are, are incarcerated as the other. These are our family members. These are our neighbors. And 95% of the people who are incarcerated will be our neighbors. They are coming home. And so it's best that we begin to have some of that more humanistic language and interaction now so that when people return home from these facilities, they actually feel and act in ways that, that is responsive to the, the human social contract. Thank you for that. Our next question comes from a student who will appear via video, uh, Paula Gaviria. I hope I'm saying that correctly, your name. Go ahead, Paula. Yeah. Uh, hello, I'm currently a student in Harris, first year MPP, and I worked in a Mexican female uh, prison for two years with women that have their children inside. And I was wondering, I always saw prison like the treatment to a social disease. So what programs or what reforms could we implement as a society to prevent incarceration, like incarceration should not exist. Like what can we do that is preventive? Uh, like early childhood initiatives or what would you propose? One thing that we are doing here in Chicago is working with um, the, the, the school system here to um, implement trauma-informed practices and healing-centered practices. Because when we put healing at the center of our interactions, people are less likely to engage in behaviors that would draw attention from the criminal justice system. It's also important that we continue to focus on um, prevention. You know, you talked about early childhood. And so while programs within correctional facilities are great, it's good for us to start with our young people. Um, and then also making sure that we um, just continue to educate ourselves, educate ourselves on the implications of, of this criminal justice system that we're working with now. In 2018, there were 10.3 million arrests in this country. And some people may say that, you know, that high number of arrests is because we are effectively dealing with the violence that occurs in this country. Well, that's simply not true. Most of the arrests that occurred were due to substance use violations. And so providing treatment for substance use disorders, providing treatment for mental health um, disorders, and making sure that we uh, just continue to um, confront all of the social ills that we know are facing many of our, our neighborhoods and communities. Um, and I'll just add this, treat, poor folk the way you treat rich folk. I mean, the, the problem isn't just that people are committing crimes. Look, I know a lot of criminals. Uh, they're CEOs. Uh, you know, they're in country clubs and yacht clubs and, and uh, on Ivy League campuses. I know a lot of criminals, but we don't call them criminals. They break the law, they got lawyers, they got all kinds of problems, they don't go to prison. Um, so, and when a rich person's kid gets on drugs all too often now some you know the tragedies befall all families but all too often there's a little bit more help for that rich person's child that rich person has a little bit more chance of winding up in rehab than in prison and yet it's very very hard for low-income people and not just black you can go to appalachia same problem low-income folk have a hard time getting to rehab you know getting help uh easy time getting in jail and prison so if we just treated law breaking among poor folk the way we treated law breaking among rich folk, uh, we would have you know, a radically smaller prison population because most of the people who are in prison are poor. Um, can't afford a good lawyer. You get charged with something, you're gonna do some time. Uh, you can be charged with God knows anything. You got a good lawyer, chances are you're not gonna do any time. And that's just the truth. Thank you. Our last question uh, this evening is going to come from Brianna Payton, who will appear on video. Hi. 
Um, I'm Brianna. I'm a master's student at the Chicago School of Social Service Administration. Um, hi, Nika. And oh, I said, you look familiar. <laughs> yeah, Nika came and spoke to my class earlier this year. Um, I just wanted to ask you guys, there is a lot of urgency right now around decarceration because of the uh, public health crisis that is, of course, affecting people that are incarcerated. Um, but of course, we need urgency around decarceration in general. And so I guess I'm wondering if you guys have thoughts on how we can channel the urgency that is existing right now and continue that into the post-COVID era, even when we're no longer in a pandemic. My response is to continue to push the system. You know, we've seen um, incredible drops in population in jails and prisons and use that as the argument that those are individuals that should have never been incarcerated in the first place. And then let's continue to have conversations like this, but the conversations have to turn into action and not action against any one political figure, but action against the system as a whole. Um, don't underestimate how much change you guys can get done, your generation. I mean, yeah, we're, we, you have to co-author change intergenerationally. So I'm not saying that people in my age group should sit down, but a lot of times people will assume that the way things are, is just impossible to change. And yet look at how much changed the past couple of months. I mean, all of a sudden it turns out like a lot of stuff is optional. You know what I mean? Uh, including your job and everything else. It's okay. like, okay. So, um, this system is a lot more plastic and elastic than they want you to think. And right now you're going to be living in a country where does it really make sense to spend $80 billion a year that you don't have uh, locking up all these people for mostly minor crap. Um, and the ones who are doing serious stuff, is this the best way to make them better? Um, you might have to take, you might have to take somebody out the neighborhood if they're acting a complete idiot, but you know, keep them away for 20 years and mistreat them and don't give them anything good and send them back home with no chances. Is that really helping the neighborhood? So a lot of stuff is just stupid. And y'all need to build a big anti-stupid coalition. <laughs> just get, I mean, why do y'all, you know, you just ask, why do you do this stuff? It's just ignorant. It's not making anybody safer and it's not fair. You know, it's not fair. And there's something about the power of young people just cut through the crap um, and, and ask for what you want and, and don't assume that you can't get it. Like I said, five years ago, it was radical to say you wanted to have health care for everybody. Nobody would argue against that today. I mean, given what's going on with this plague, I mean, they may not want the government to pay for it, but nobody's going to argue that, you know, if you're sick in America, you should be able to see a doctor. Um, or, or if you're working in these frontline jobs, you should get paid more than $10 an hour or $8 an hour or $6 an hour. Um, so a lot of stuff that might have seemed really radical uh, a couple of years ago is, is going to make a lot of sense going forward. So, you know, fight for what you want. If you don't fight for what you want, you deserve what you get. Mm, thank you. <laughs> Spoken like a true parent, too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there is no cure, no vaccine for COVID-19 so far. And it's a disease that uh, we must learn to live with. And our guests that we've had um, provide so much wisdom this evening will help determine how that works in the criminal justice system. So thanks to you, Ben Jones. Thanks to you, Dr. Tapia. Uh, and thanks to our audience and to the staff at the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics. I'm Cheryl Corley. Good evening. Thank you. <laughs>